All right, so t t this lecture I'm giving today is actually new for the semester, uh, but it's something that I've been interested in for a while, because uh, certainly we've been struggling with this uh, in, our, in our own system to, to build out the networking layer. Um, so just real quick, the reminder for everyone, the, uh, the, the major things that are coming up for you guys are uh, in class on Wednesday this week, two days from now, we'll have the midterm, and, uh, and design again be take, take the hour and 20 minutes. Then uh, the, during spring break on March 12th, the skip list will be due at midnight. And then the first Monday after spring break, when you come back, we will discuss, uh, you guys will be presenting your proposals for, for the project. Um, so for today's lecture, I'll, I'll spend the first half talking about the, the paper you guys read on the networking protocol. And then I'll finish up by going through a bunch of different topics that you can choose for project number three. Um, this is obviously not an exhaustive list, but these are the ones that I think are interesting and are doable within the time we have left in the semester. Um, so if you have any questions about the things I'll talk about, you can send me an email. I'll have time to meet uh, maybe next week or, or, or early in this week uh, to meet the group and discuss things. Otherwise, we can correspond over, over, over uh, email. And then I'll send out a link to, on Piazza tonight on the, uh, to, a, to a spreadsheet on, on, on Google Docs where you can list your project group and then what your project topic is, because we can't have two groups picking the same thing. All right, so for today's class, again, the focus is going to be on the, the networking protocol of the database system. How do we actually have our client interact with the database and send it, send it messages and get back data? So first, we'll talk out, start off talking about data, database access APIs. Um, and then we'll expand that and talk about how, what, the, what the actual network protocols look like. And that was in the paper that you guys read. And then we'll finish up with optimizations to uh, minimize the overhead from the operating system to be able to send network messages. So th these are called kernel bypass methods. Okay? All right, so the, the, the database's access API is essentially how the program is going to interact with the database. And so in all the demos that I've given in this class so far, when I open up the terminal, you know, I'm, I'm connecting to MySQL or Postgres, right? these are all through, through, through the terminal. And essentially what's happening here is I'm writing SQL queries on the command line. I hit enter, then it sends a network message. The data system executes that, sends back the result, and we print it out on the, on, to, to standard out on the terminal. But obviously nobody writes programs going through the terminal, right? Because that would be really, really slow to parse text on the, on the, from the terminal output. So instead, real programs that are used a database will access it through some kind of API. This will allow us to have a programmatic way to, to send queries, get back results, and then incorporate them in our program logic to do whatever it is that we want our application to do. So the three essential ways that you can essentially do this are to use a direct access API, and this would be something that's very database system specific. Like Think of like SQLite, you can open it up inside your application and you can make calls to a C API or whatever binding you're using to invoke you know, queries and get back results in the database system. Um, and then there's these two other standards, the ODBC and the JDBC standard, where these are designed to be uh, sort of universal APIs that every single database system can support so that in, if you write your application using ODBC for DB2 with very little change, in theory, you can then have that application uh, get ported to MySQL or Postgres. And I say in theory because, as we'll see in a second, the ODBC API is essentially how you define what, what uh, commands you want to execute at a high level. Like, I want to execute a query. I want to connect to a database. But it doesn't say what exactly the, the query you'd be sending it, which is going to be SQL, and that may be, may be different based on what kind of database system you have. So it's a high-level programmatic way to do this. So... It started with ODBC in the, uh, in the early 1990s. Prior to this, all the different database systems had their own uh, libraries that you would use to then invoke commands on to, to your database system. So this made all our code really unportable because, again, the DB2 library would be totally different than, than the Oracle library. And so there were some attempts in the, the 1980s to come up with a, a standard API um, and there was one other competing one at the same time from other database uh, man, uh, vendors. But for whatever reason, the Microsoft guys and this company called Sima Technologies, which is still around, their proposal for the Open Database Connectivity API 
ODBC. This ended up being the standard that all the different database companies then adopted. So pretty much every single major relational database system now, and in some cases some of the NoSQL databases, uh, they will have a ODBC driver. Right? They'll have an implementation of the OD, 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 ODBC API that you can then link into your program and invoke queries to, or you know, interact with, with the database system. So the basic model of ODBC is a device driver uh, model. And so that basically means is that there's the, the, the database vendor has to provide uh, an ODBC driver that will have all the logic that you need to convert whatever commands you have in your application code to then be able to send the, the request over to the database system and get back the result and then present you that result in, in your programming language, right? So the way to think of this is like, this is like you know, your Python library, uh, C library, that you would then write in your imperative program to then you know, open a connection to the database, send a query and get back a result. And what's gonna happen is the, the, the ODP driver itself knows how to take the standard ODBC calls and then convert them into the database system specific wire protocol that uh, the database system expects to execute, right? So at a high level, again, ODBC is just again a programming API, but this part here, what we're gonna focus on today is, the, is what we call the wire protocol. This is always gonna be database system specific, right? So the type of things you can invoke with uh, an ODP driver, I mean, the things you would expect there to be, right? System discovery, connection, uh, disconnection, and then you can send any SQL queries you want over that, you get back the results uh, and, and from, from the database server, and then the driver knows how to take whatever format those results are in and convert it into the format that the, your application expects it to be in. Right, so if it's Python, it needs to be Python integers or Python strings. If it's C, it needs to be C integers or C strings. Right, so the driver does all that for you. Um, one thing you can also do with the, an OPC driver, you can have the driver actually emulate certain features or functionalities that are defined in the ODBC API that your database system may not actually support. So an example would be cursors. So a cursor is basically, you run a select statement, and instead of getting back all the results at once, you basically get like an iterator, and you can say get next, get next, get next. And what could happen is you could have the cursor be, be stored here on the database system, especially if it's a really large result, and anytime you say get next in your application code on the ODBC driver, that would then cause another request to go over and you get back another batch of, batch of results. But if your database system doesn't support cursors, what you can then, then, then do is just send the request, get back all the results, have it sit in memory in the driver, and the driver pretends that it has a real cursor, right? So this is all hidden to you from you from the application. It's all handled inside the ODBC driver. So now, uh, the, in the Java world, uh, they're not going to have ODBC. They have something called JDBC. And basically, Sun in the 1990s uh, recognized that since we want you know, Java programs to be running you know, in the enterprise and we want to be able to connect to databases, they proposed their own standard uh, API, a programming API for connecting to database systems that they call JDBC. And it's heavily modeled after ODBC. So the way to sort of think about this, ODBC is for C programs, and then the JDBC is for Java programs. But at a high level, they're basically doing the same thing. But what is interesting about JDBC, and it's worth mentioning, is that they support a bunch of different ways to actually implement your drivers. Uh, and so the first way is just you, you just have your Java code, the Java JDBC implementation, is just a wrapper around ODBC. So through JNI, you, the Java code would then invoke the C library, ODBC, which then knows how to then you know, send out the messages over the wire protocol to the database system. The alternative is you can have a native API driver. So this would be in Java code, instead of invoking ODBC, you invoke the database system, database system specific commands you know, directly on the database system. Whether that goes over the network or not depends on, on the implementation. The third approach uh, is to use a middleware. We basically have some service running on, on, on another machine and your JDBC connects to that. And then that middleware knows how to take your, your, your request and then convert that to the appropriate database system request. Right, so set, like, so in, in these guys, th this one here would be embedded in the same, the same JVM as your program that's running. This would be an outside process. And the last one is to have a, a, a protocol driver that's in, implemented entirely in, in Java. So it's running uh, native Java code 
and then it, it invokes whatever the wire protocol you need to have for, for the database system. Um, so in this case here, I think this is the most common one for uh, the major systems. And, but at the very least, every single database system, if you actually want to be, have it be usable, you need ODBC. And then whether you have one that's written in Java or not depends on your, uh, it depends on whether you have time to actually implement this. Yes? So what's the difference between the number three and number four? So this question is, what's the difference between number two and number four? Um, so this would be like, this would be like the, invoking the wire protocol, and this would be calling like directly into the database system. So if you were on the same machine, you can then you know send IPC requests to the, the database process. Does it imply that the number two only can run like on the local This question is does, does this imply that that number two can only run on the native machine? I think the example I gave, yes. I don't know whether it that's required though. I don't think again, I, I think this one and this one are the most common. The first one and the last one. Actually, although the first one I don't think is supported anymore. Um so, my, so this one's definitely the most common in, in, in the major systems. All right, so the thing we want to talk about, though, is what is this? What is the, the, the vendor-specific database protocol? Um, and so the way to think about this, all the major database systems uh, will support their own proprietary wire protocol that they'll, that they'll communicate with the client, between the client and the server over TCP IP. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think any data system, especially if you want to support transactions, will support UDP because you have no guarantee that those packets are actually going to show up. Um, or, you, I mean, and if you do, you have to do extra work on your in the user level to make sure that it actually happens. So everyone's going to connect over TCP. So a typical client server interaction would be basically the client connects to the database system. Uh, there may be an SSL handshake, so you, you can establish a, a secure connection. But then you begin the authentication process. Then the client sends a query request. The data system takes that query, executes it, takes the results, serializes it, serializes it into the format that the wire protocol expects, sends that back to the client. The client then deserializes that and then admits it to the application in, in, the, in the format that the programming language, the programming environment expects there to be. So all these back and forth, this is the wire protocol portion of what we're talking about in today's class. Right? How do we take, you know, what is the request that comes over? How do we take a result? package it up, and send it back. So the paper you guys read was really focused on essentially this part here. How do you actually send back the results? Because that's the most expensive thing. right? Sending a single query, I mean, it's not that big, right? Most SQL queries are you know, a few kilobytes. Sometimes they're really, really large, but even then there's not much. Uh, it's just, you're just sending you know, uh, SQL itself, or text. You're sending strings. So there's not really optimizations you can do too much for that. So it's really the focus on today is, is really this. So as I said, all the major database systems have their own wire protocol, and they're not compatible with each other at all. And so this is what ODBC solves. ODBC uh, masks the complexity of this wire protocol so that you can write your application and just only worry about implementing against ODBC and not worry about all of this, how, what, what do the actual packets look like? The driver takes care of all of that for you. Um, one thing I do see, though, in newer systems is newer systems don't actually implement their own wire protocol, right? It's not easy to do, and then you have to support it, and then you have to support it in, in your drivers. So it's very common now in newer systems to actually pick one of the open source systems and just implement whatever wire protocol they have. Um, and the advantage of this is that you, you basically get all of the client-side ecosystem or the drivers for free, right? So Postgres has drivers for Python, for C, for any pro possible programming language you can think of, they have bindings or libraries for it. And so if you implement the Postgres wire protocol, which we try to do, then you don't have to you know, implement those drivers all over again and support them. So it's very common in startups and newer systems that this is the route that they go. But the one thing to point out though is just because your database system speaks the wire protocol of another open source system, it doesn't mean that you're automatically compatible with them, right? So you can send packets back and forth, but what actually what goes on inside those packets can be totally different or totally not supported in your new system. So for example, uh, if you support Postgres, for example, Postgres, a lot of tools will inspect the Postgres catalog to figure out what data or what tables you actually have. 
So if your Postgres, if your catalogs in your new system doesn't look like the Postgres catalogs, then the application that connects to it, it'll be able to send requests because you speak the Postgres wire protocol, but it doesn't know how to, you can't get back the results you expect there to be. Right? Same thing with SQL. There may be a SQL feature that Postgres supports or MySQL supports that your new system that speaks the wire protocol doesn't support. So I poked around a little bit uh, over the weekend, and uh, the paper talks a little bit about this, but as far as I can tell, the two prominent uh, protocols that everyone implements is MySQL and Postgres. Um, for MySQL, there's MemSQL and Clustrix, ActorDB, and TidyDB out of, um, the, in China. These all speak to MySQL protocol. And in the case of Postgres, Redshift, Greenplum, and Vertica, they speak the Postgres protocol, but this is no surprise because they're essentially derivatives of Postgres, right? So Greenplum took Postgres 8, rewrote the bottom portion of the system to make it parallel and, and, and a column store. Same thing with Vertica, right? So this is, this is no surprise that they speak the Postgres protocol because it was a Postgres to begin with. Same thing with Redshift. Redshift is just, uh, originally was Parkcell, which is also based on Postgres. Uh, Amazon bought a license for it repackage it as Redshift, and so it's based on Postgres, so you, you, know, you get the, the Postgres protocol. And since then, they've, they've rewritten a lot of it, so I don't know how much, how much of Postgres is still in there. Um, in the case of Hyper, CockroachDB, and our system, Peloton, these are all written from scratch. So we, we, we look at the Postgres wire protocol. Uh, my students that are here had to open up Wireshark, figure out what the packets are, and we re-implemented that. Um, there's actually a lot of great documentation for Postgres. You know, it's not trivial to do, but there was documentation to, to, for us to implement the Postgres wire protocol fairly easily. Whereas in MySQL, I think it's it's um, it's not as clear. So again, the the advantage of this is that you get the drivers for free, but you still have to support all the extra crap in the system, like catalogs and SQL, to make it actually appear as if it's Postgres. So this is the one of the things that MemSQL did right in, when they first started their company. Uh, is that they went out of their way to make it look as much like MySQL as possible so that it could be a drop-in replacement for MySQL. Um, so you didn't have to change any of your application code. You point it to your MemSQL cluster, your MemSQL machines, and it looked like MySQL and it ran so much faster. And I think from a business side, that was really smart. All right, so for today's class, from the paper you guys read, uh, I want to discuss four aspects of the, uh, the wire protocol that you can actually implement that can... Can, that will you know, affect performance a lot. And I really like this paper that you guys read. Um, it's out of the MoniDB guys in, in CWI in Europe. Um, the reason why I love this paper, because this is a paper that like, I wish I wrote, right? This is something that I've been thinking about for a while. I'm like, man, I, I, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that, that I didn't write it and they did, but I'm glad that somebody actually wrote it, right? Because there's no other paper that goes in this kind of detail and, and sort of breaks down what's going on with, um, with JDBC and ODBC and how it affects performance. So I, so I think this, this is one of the best papers that I've read in, in recent time. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. All right, so the things we want to discuss are uh, row storage versus column storage, compression, data serialization, and string handling. So another thing I'll say too is a lot of these topics sounds a lot like the things we talked about before for database storage, right? We talked about compression. We talked about row storage versus column storage. Right? So this is, a lot of these things are exactly the same thing we had to deal when we talk about executing queries on our, on our database, but now we're talking about how to actually send data back to the client. So the first issue is whether you want to have a row store or a column store layout in the result that we send back. So the ODBC and JDBC are inherently uh, row-oriented APIs. So what does that mean? So it means you execute a SQL query, and then you have this cursor or iterator where you call basically fetch row or get next row, and you have a while loop that says keep you know, doing this or keep repeating my loop until I run out of rows. So you're processing things inherently at, on a row by row basis. And this makes sense from the time that these, these APIs were developed in the 1990s because back then, databases were primarily used for business applications or transaction processing workloads where you know, you're, you're, you're clearly operating on a row by row basis. Right? This is before people really started doing you know, big learning or big data and machine learning on our, on our large data sets. Right? Back then, databases weren't that big. Um, so the programs you wrote for them were these business applications where you, you would want to go over things one row by row. But as they discuss in the paper, now with people want to do data analysis, 
uh, on, on, our, on your database, the, the, the data that you collected, all these data analysis frameworks don't run inside the database system, right? Things like Spark, TensorFlow, Torch, all these things are external to the database system. So that means we need to get the data out and then put it into those frameworks. So in these frameworks, they are inherently, uh, in many cases, the, the underlying storage of how they represent data or matrices is as column stores. So having to get the data out on a row-by-row -row basis, then package it up back into columns and then put it into TensorFlow is going to be slow. So this is sort of the problem that, that they're trying to solve. How do you do bulk data extraction out of the database and put it into a form that these programs can um, decipher very quickly? And so the solution that they propose is exactly the solution that we saw when we talked about query processing models is to do it on a vector, vectorized approach, right? Instead of having things send it back as a single row at a time or a single column at a time, you'll send things as back as batches of rows, but internally they'll be represented as columns. And that makes it easier for the, um, again, for the data analysis program, the ODPC driver to then take the data out and then put it into th these other uh, frameworks. Right, so again, this looks a lot like we talked about before with query processing and query execution. The column store approach is better for large-scale data analysis, but because we want to send things over the network, they're proposing to do things as vectors. The next issue we have is compression. So again, we had this big trade-off when we talked about compression a few weeks ago. We can use naive compression where we just take the, the block of bytes we want to send back and run snappy or gzip on it and then send that back over, over the wire. Um, and then on the client side, you just have to un unzip the entire thing. Alternatively, we can do a, uh, a specialized encoding on the columns of data, things like run length encoding, delta encoding, a dictionary encoding. Um, and for this, we can take advantage of the skew skewness and the repetitive nature of the data we're sending back and get better com better compression scheme. So what the paper talks about is that Essentially, what happens is that the, the naive compression scheme actually works out to be the, 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 the best approach because it's agnostic to the layout of the data, and you don't have to do any extra work to figure out you know, what's, the, what's the right compression scheme I want to use. So they argue that essentially you just take whatever you have and just compre compress it using Snappy, and that'll be good enough. Um, they do discuss about like if, you're, if your network is slow, then maybe you want to use gzip or xz, something more, more heavyweight. Um, if it's much faster, then something like Snappy or Z standard would be would be better. And obviously, you get better compression ratios the larger your chunk sizes or block sizes are. And so, you know, they they, they discuss the trade-offs between between these different things. Um, so again, the main thing here is that uh, naive compression is probably going to be the best approach. All right, another big issue is now how are we actually going to to serialize our data and send it back. So there's essentially two ways to do this. The first is that you can have a binary encoding where you basically take the data you have and you encode it in this binary form and you send, put that in the packet and you send that back. Um, the tricky thing about this is like if your database server is running on a CPU that has one type of Endian and your client runs on another type of Endian, on the client side you need to make sure that you flip, flip the bits around so that it comes out to be in the correct form that you expect it to be. Now, most of the times, everybody's running on, on Intel CPUs, so this is not really an issue, but you, you could be running on an ARM or power, and it could be something different. So you need to be able to handle that. Um, I forget whether they said the client driver always handles this or the server side handles this. I think the client driver always handles this, but they need to, you need to know what you're getting and what you're returning. Another thing they talk about, too, is that the closer that the, the, the serialized format of the data you send back in your packets, the closer that is to the form that the the database stores things internally, then the less work you have to do because now you just take the bytes that you're getting back from your result and put that back into exactly the form that, the, that should go in the packet and, then, and you don't have to do any extra work. So we have this problem in our own system because we need to support the Postgres wire protocol. We don't actually store data exactly as, po as Postgres stores it. So we have to do a, an extra transformation step to put it into the correct form. Now, I don't think it's a major overhead, right? But we, it's, it's something we have to do in order to make, make it work. Um, so if we had modified the Postgres wire protocol 
to natively store our data directly into the into the packets, then we would have to go change all the client drivers to to take that different data. Uh, and, we, and we obviously don't want to do that because that's you know that's a, that's a lot of work to support everything. So there's basically two ways to get binary encoding. You could have the database system write, write its own serialization API to store the data out into to, to the to the messages. Or you can rely on existing li libraries like Google's protocol buffers or Facebook's thrift to take the data you, 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 you want to send back, package it up in some kind of message structure. It has its own serial serialization format or serialization uh, command to convert that to the bytes, put that into your packets, and then you send that back. And then on the client side, you basically get to do the reverse of this. So they argue that implementing your own is always the best way to go because these Things like protobuf, for example, are these general purpose libraries that do a bunch of extra stuff you may not actually need to do if you just want to send back data over your wire protocol. So protocol, protobufs have this extra things where they, they keep track of the different versions or the, 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 the version ID of the message that you're sending back so that the other side knows what schema it should be using when it deciphers the bytes, right? So there's all this extra overhead that you may not actually need uh, if you control both the client side and the server side. You, you know exactly what the web prior protocol should be, and you can, you can conform your data into that. The alternative is to do, uh, basically convert all your binary values that you want to send back, just convert that into text, right? Like run two string on it, package it up in your packets, and then send that over to the client, and on the client side, they can then uh, do the reverse of that and put it back into its binary form. Right, so say I have a integer that's four bytes, one, two, three, four, five, six. When I want to send this over the network, I'll literally make this, you know, a string that has the characters one, two, three, four, five, six. Send that over, then the client knows how to reverse that and put that back into its form. Right? The advantage of this is that you don't have to worry about anything about any of this because it's a, it's it's characters. So whatever the whatever the reverse of putting the text string into binary form, right? S2I, on the client side, it'll know how to, you know, it, it know how to handle the, the proper order of the, byte, the bits. Um, the downside, of course, is that this is going to be much larger for really long uh, integers, right? So in this case here, I, I know I have to store at least six bytes uh, for six characters, um, but I'm probably also going to need to store the, the length to know how many bytes I have, or a null terminator, so it's probably going to be more than six bytes. So even though it's the same amount of data, I have to send I have to send more of it. So most systems implement this, the binary encoding. I think Postgres can switch down into this text mode. Is that correct? It does both. Um, and then mode ADB does does the, does this as well. Um, but you get better performance for, for this one here. But you have to do more work. Question. What's your relationship between serialization and compression? Which one happens first? So his question is. What, what is the relationship between serialization and compression? Um, you would do, um, if you're, say, say, say you're doing naive compression, right? Just, you take, just running snappy or gzip on it. You do this first, then you have your, your byte blocks, uh, and then you can compress that. So the bytes for serialization come from like uh, compression? The bytes from serialization come from compression? Yeah, is that true? No, no, you would serialize it first, yes. then you compress it. Okay. Right, because this doesn't make any sense. Like, how would you, like, if I compress this string, I have a bunch of random bits, right? I, don't, I, I can't make any sense of that. But you don't have to, like, get the idea of it, like, what you're going to transfer in to the network, right? Because you just want to, like, serialize it and get the data back. So your question is, your statement is, it doesn't matter like which one comes first. Oh, so I see. So think of it. So there's there's more going on here that I'm just like I'm showing a single value, but like think of like you have a row and it has ten attributes, and I want to send that row back. How do you actually kind you know, of represent like here's the first value, here's the second value? You need like delimiters, or you need a way to say I know that this offset I have this, and that offset I have that. Now in our database system. We know what those offsets are because we have the schema, but we not gonna, we, we're not going to send that back over, over the network, right? So we need a way, way to have it, uh, like you know break things up, because again the schema 
the schema we have in our catalog to decipher the, the, the bytes in our tables is not going to be exactly how they, you know, the, what our query is generating. Do the compression like, happens after the serialization? Compression ha happens after serialization. You have a giant byte array yep. for naive compression. You have a giant byte array, you compress it, and then you send that back over as a blob. Uh, for columnar encoding, you do that before. I mean, if, you're, if you're trying to have a compressed encoding like RLE, that's that's part of this process here. Yes. Okay. All right. So the last thing is how do we handle uh, strings? And again, this is exactly the same issues we're going to have in the storage of the database system. So essentially, there's there's three approaches. So the first is that you can do null termination, and this is how they do this in C and C++. We have our, our string, a bunch of ASCII characters or, or a byte characters, and then at the last one, we're going to store this null uh, this null character to say that this is the end of the string. So what will happen is on the client side, you don't actually know where the you know the the end is. All right, you have to scan and look at every single uh, character until you find this thing, and then then you know you're done. The alternative is to do uh, to prefix the string with the the number of bytes. Uh, of, of that string. So the first, whatever, four, four, four bytes, or depending on how, how you encode it, we say here's my length, and I know from that point at the end of that length to some another offset, that's the actual string I'm sending back. The alternative is to do fixed width approach, and basically you say, I know what the, si the max size of the attribute is that I'm serializing on the, on the server side, and I make every string that corresponds to that attribute in every single tuple that I'm sending back, I make that be the that that size, and I pad out the 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 the, the suffix with a bunch of empty, empty spaces to say you know to, to fill it out, so everything's nicely byte aligned, or not, everything's nicely aligned, and I don't need to store the I don't need to store the the prefix, and I don't need to store a null terminator. So I think um, they said that um, in the paper. I think in some cases this was faster, in some cases this was faster. Right? And this thing was fast, if it, if, or better, if the, the max size was small, but that's not always going to be the case. Because right? it depends on how things are stored in the, in the table. All right, so I want to show two graphs. Uh, so I know in the paper they proposed this sort of vectorized, compressed version of, of how to send data back. Um, I don't want to cover that. I just want to show what the overhead is or what the performance is for the existing protocols that are out there. Um, and so this is this we got this data from the guys at, at MoneyDB. Um, so they had uh, eight different implementations, eight different uh, systems they they would compare against. They have MoneyDB, which is the system they built, uh, MySQL with and without compression, Postgres, Oracle, DB2, Hive, which is the like a, a wrapper, so a SQL front end for HDFS and Hadoop, and then MongoDB because MongoDB actually has an, an ODBC driver here. So for this first experiment, we want to do is we just want to measure how much time it takes to send one tuple. So you have a single select statement, and to grab one tuple, and how much time does it take to, to actually send that back? And the way, and, then, and on the ODB side, on the client side, they didn't actually generate any result. It just threw the data away. So it didn't actually do any processing. It's just how much time does it take for the server to serialize the result and send it back? And they're running this experiment with the client and the server on the same machine. We'll see in a second. Uh, you may have to go through the operating system for that, and that's going to be slow. Um, and so the, the, you know, they're, they're going to be measuring really what's the overhead of, of the serialization approach on the client side for the different protocols. So what you see going across is that uh, the fastest one actually ends up being MySQL. Um, so these are in, in seconds. So these, are, these, these measures are in, in milliseconds. The other thing I'll say, too, is the way they... Um, the way they minimize the overhead of actually query execution is they would run the query multiple times, have it everything be cached in, on the server side, so that when they ran the query again to do their measurements, it wasn't like it was going through the whole parsing and planning and optimization phase. It was just how to get the result back and, and send it back over the wire. So the, the two surprises for me was how much slower DB2 was. Um, in the case of Hive, I don't know whether this is because it's it's... Java or it's this HDFS thing or a Hadoop thing, um, but the protocol was definitely more heavyweight than than all these other ones here, right? And Mongo did did decent. So now what they, the next experiment they did was 
they um, actually another thing to point out too is the the in this case here, MonadyB was doing the the text encoding, whereas all these uh, the the MySQL and Postgres were doing the binary encoding. So there's some cases where the the, the binary encoding was was much faster, and other cases where it was actually slower. All right, so this next experiment here, we're now going to transfer a million tuples, and this was sort of again the the problem they were trying to solve is how can we do large-scale data extraction efficiently having to go through a, a client protocol like ODBC. And so for this, think of this as like just running select star with no where clause, and you're trying to see how fast you can stream the, the, the data out. So I, I wanted to break up the, the, presen the, the, the presentation to be able to show you the compression numbers first and then everything else, but I can't do that because MoneyDB comes first. But the, along the, 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 the x-axis, they're going to increase the amount of latency in the network, and then the y-axis is just how long it actually took. So, of course, no surprise, in the case of uh, MoneyDB and for all the systems, as you increase the latency, the time it takes actually to get the data out goes longer, right? Because the network is slower. The one I want to point out, though, is, um, is compressed MySQL, where using a heavyweight compression scheme, you end up sort of amortizing that cost of, of even though the network got slower, it essentially was always going to be the same, right? And so to me, again, this is just because they're, just, they're sending less data, and, and it's the computational overhead of, the, uh, of doing the compression is what ends up being the, the dominating cost here. And then for everyone else, uh, as, you can, as you increase the, the, the slowness of the, of the network, the performance gets worse. The only one that also is surprising here is Oracle starts off being the, the, the second fastest um, on a fast network, but then as you increase the network latency, it ended up going, being slower. Um, and I forget why they, they said this was the case. All right, so any questions about this? All right, so the, the, the network wire protocol implementation inside the database system is not going to be the only source of slowdown in, in our data system when, when, when we want to send data in and out. As I said multiple times throughout the semester, the operating system is our frenemy, right? It causes problems, and one big problem we're going to hit with is, is in the TCP IP stack. So when we want to send messages over the network, the, we have to go through the kernel. And it turns out to be really, really slow. The reason is because the way the, the operating system is going to implement the, the, the TCP IP protocol in, in, inside of itself is through... Uh, it's through interrupts with context switches. So when a message shows up, you get an interrupt to say, hey, this, for this NIC, I now have a packet. Do a context switch to some other thread, and it can go in and, and, and process that. Then we want to get data out at all different le levels of the system. Before, you know, from the time it goes from the actual NIC, the hardware device, to when it shows up in our, in our beloved database process, that data is going to be copied multiple times. And that means memory allocation. And memory allocation means that you have to take latches or locks inside the, in the OS to, to get memory. And then, in general, because this is a, a, the kernel is multi-threaded, there's going to be all sort of latches inside of, inside of the kernel to protect the various data structures that it has. Right? Because you have context switches, because some thread is going to go off and, and handle the uh, interrupt to take our packet. So, again, the, we need the OS to sort of survive, but we want to maybe avoid it as much as possible when we want to send our network messages. So this is what the kernel bypass methods do. And so the idea is that uh, with kernel bypass, that we're going to allow the, 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 our database system to be able to get packets on and off of the, of the hardware device, the NIC, the Ethernet card, uh, as, as without having to go through the kernel. And so, again, the advantage of this is that you don't have to have any, any contact switches because your, your thread and your database processes can go down to the, the NIC and get data out directly. Um, you're not going to do any necessary, uh, unnecessary data copying because you're literally going to get the buffers off of the NIC and put it directly into your, in your database process. Right? And you can share, mem share memory between the two of them. And then, because we're not going through the OS TCP IP stack, again, we don't have to worry about the multi-threading issues that, are, that can happen inside, inside the kernel. Right? So there's essentially two ways to do this. Or two, 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 yeah, two approaches for, the, for this. The first is what is called the data plane development kit. 
Right, so this is an actual library, a thing called the DPDK, the Data Plane Development Kit. Uh, so, th so this is just a, a, an implementation of a kernel bypass method to get to the NIC. Um, and then another approach is, is to do remote direct memory access. And this is a high level construct or a concept uh, that you can use to access memory remotely. So this is like a library that you can, you can download called DPDK. And then this is more of a technique, right? I didn't know what, other than it's calling these kernel bypass, but this is technically kernel bypass too. So I didn't, didn't know what to call the two of them. So the, the DPDK is a set of libraries, I think originally written by Intel, but then now it's been open source and is part of the, uh, the Linux foundation. Um, and essentially these libraries allow your program to access the, the NIC directly. So you basically have to do a bunch of extra work in your database system code, which is okay because that's what they pay us to do, that will essentially manage memory ourselves. And we then pass these buffers to the DBDK, and the DBDK can then put packets, the raw packets we get off the NIC, into, into, the, into, the, uh, into those buffers. We bring them up to our, to our, to our process, and we can process them, or our database system, we can process them just as if we got them from the OS. So you're skipping the TCP, IB stack in the operating system entirely, right? So again, the advantage of this is that you don't get any data, data copying, you don't have any system calls, you don't have to handle any interrupts in the kernel, right? We basically go around the kernel to get data on and off the NIC. So as far as I can tell, there's only one system that actually implements this approach or uses this, right? It's this thing called ScaliaDB. ScaliaDB is a C++ implementation of Cassandra. So they basically took, you know, re-implemented the Cassandra wire protocol and built their own system uh, that, that looks a lot like it. But everything runs in C++, and then they have this library called CSTAR that uses, <coughs> excuse me, the DPDK to, to access the NIC directly. How portable is this uh, So this question is, how portable is the DPDK? As far as I know, it, it runs fully featured in Linux, um, and then they have a partial implementation for FreeBSD. I don't know if, I don't know if there's an equivalent in Windows. The other issue question I, I don't have the answer to is, can you use the DBDK on a, a virtualized environment like on EC2? Because because think about it, in if you get an instance on EC2, you're running you know multiple VMs on the same box. I don't know how the kernel bypass method works for that. Right? And I asked the Intel guy, and he, he didn't know. Um, I suppose we can try, but it runs on Linux. What else would you want? Right? Um, and. and and it also, it also, I think it only runs on certain, certain NICs, right? Because it's like sort of the ODBC, you have to have a DBDK driver that can then support this library. So think of this DBDK as like ODBC, but going after the bare metal hardware, right? And then for Scalia, guys, for Scalia DB guys, um, they've, they've used their DBDK implementation or network stack for Scalia DB, and they've also used a like, uh, memcache version of it, and they show it being like 2x faster. And again, 2x faster just by avoiding the OS is quite significant. Yes? Are you still going to have uh, reliable transmission like TCP? So this question is, is this still reliable transmission like TCP? I think no. so. I, I think you have DBDK. Yeah, so, yeah you, if you have DBDK, I think so, yes, it's still reliable. Because I still think it's at the lowest layer, right? So, so the retransmission, retransmission is before you get to all this other stuff. All right, the other, the other kernel bypass method is to do RDMA. So with RDMA, it's basically you have, say you have a distributed, distributed system, you want to read and write memory to another machine, and you still have to go to the network to make that happen, but when you land on the, ser the other side, the server, the NIC knows how to go into memory and read that value or write that value you want, without having to send a packet up into the operating system, the operating system do the write. So the, so the hardware can sort of do the write, the read and write to memory by avoiding the kernel entirely, right? So the, the make this thing work, you, you need to know what address you're reading and writing from on, on the client side in order to make that request on the server side. And then the other thing is that the, 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 the memory access is completely transparent to the machine that's being accessed. So on the client side, if I do a read and write into memory, there's no notification, there's no callback, there's no event that gets triggered on the server side to say, hey, by the way, someone wrote to you at this memory location. 
So the tricky thing about this is now you need to be able to manage, you know, in your system, you need to recognize that, oh, uh, you know, in the same way we did before, we have, you know, handle different transactions updating the same tuple at the same time without having to coordinate each other. We essentially need to do the same thing. And I don't know for RDMA, I don't know how, um, uh, I don't know what, at, at what level the writes can be atomic. Question. How to like implement to like directly access remote memory? So this question is how do you, how would you actually implement this in a database system? Yes. So you basically on the client side you need to know what the address space is. So like the address has to still be transmitted through network layer. Correct. Yeah. And all the way up to TCP. So so there's there'll be a library. Like an R, you, you, you'll use like an RDMA library that you, you make make calls like read and write and you pass the memory address and then that's what gets sent over the network and then on the on the the hardware has to be able to support those commands and know like I need to jump to this address and read stuff. There, it has specific requirements for hardware. Specific requirement for what? For a hardware? Yeah, so your hardware has to support this. So uh, there's this thing called InfiniBand, sold by Mellanox. It's very expensive. Uh, you have to have Mellanox NICs on both sides and a router to, to be able to handle this. And for this question, and it's sort of like completely intuitive that you can like uh, guarantee, <coughs> there, uh, guarantee that from the without, but like while you're getting rid of the TCP IP layer. So his question is, his, uh, his the earlier question from the, from 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 Chen Yi was. How do you make sure this be actually reliable? Uh, if you get rid of TCP entirely, I think the low-level networking substrate takes care of that for you. Which means you have to take care of yourself. No, I think the hard, I think the hardware takes care of it. Like the protocol and the hardware takes care of that for you. You, you have to run a specialized hardware make, for RDMA to work. I think there you can do RDMA over Ethernet. I think that does exist now, but traditionally with the Finiband, you have to, you had to buy their hardware. I don't think it doesn't? Although they are third-party applications based on TCP. Right. So, yeah, so his statement was, uh, I don't, yeah, yeah, you're probably right, yes. So his statement was, uh, he's right, that raw DPDK does not support TCP. You, if you want reliable transmission, you have to do that yourself. Yeah. So I think RDMA is probably, might be the same thing. I don't know. So as far as I can tell, uh, I don't think any, there's no major database system, like commercial one that supports RDMA. Oracle's and Finiban might do this, or Oracle might do this for Rack and Exadata, like real expensive million dollar machines. But like, you know, you download MySQL, they're not going to support this. Um, Microsoft has a really interesting project called Farm, where they basically showed how to, how to do transaction processing entirely over RDMA. And I think you end up having to do like four phase commit because again, you don't know when things, uh, you don't know when other transactions read and write to data that's on your machine. So there's a bunch of extra steps you have to do to make sure that everything's running uh, correctly. Okay, so the just to finish up, the I think the networking protocol is often overlooked bottleneck for performance. Uh, you know, when you think about the, the, I had you guys read that Looking Glass paper uh, early in the semester, right? They talked about the buffer pool, they talked about logging, they talked about transactions. They completely ignored networking and they completely ignored what it takes to actually write data out to disk, right? And I think those things are actually uh, major bottlenecks that are, that are worth looking at. And then for the kernel bypass methods for networking, um, it's you get vastly improved performance, uh, but it requires more bookkeeping. It requires more work to be done as us, the database developers inside of our system, and able to use these techniques and use these optimizations. And I suspect also, too, the case that the, uh, at least in, in the short term, things like the DBDK and the uh, RDMA are going to be mostly useful for the internal database communication between in, in, in a distributed environment, right? Meaning the uh, you wouldn't have to write you know a, a new client driver for Postgres that uses the DPDK that would be handled on on the server side. All right, any questions? In the back. Yeah. So for the serialization part. Yes. Um, there are actually many parameters such as like whether compression is good, whether like the amount of data that we are sending. So is there any implementation which has existed which is adapted? So, so his question is, as in the paper shows, uh, there's no one size fits all for all these different decisions in our design space. So is there any 
uh, network protocol implementation in a data system that's adaptive that can then recognize, oh, my data looks like this. For this this result, I want to use compression, and my data looks like that. I want to you know look, look, do something else. I don't think anybody does that. I think everyone just picks one and, and, and runs with it, just uses that. But you can imagine, absolutely, as you said, my data, I, I know my data looks like this, and, and, and therefore, maybe I pass along a little thing in the header that says, I'm encoding it this way, and the client would be able to handle that. Again, the, the, the think about what, if you had to actually support that, though, that means every single client driver would have to, have to support all the different possible ways you can encode things, right? And that's why I don't think anybody implements something that's really complicated. You pick one and just use that. Okay, project three. All right, so uh, again, project two is due uh, next week during spring break, but everyone should start thinking about project three. So this is gonna be a group project and probably just use the same group you had for project two. Um, we're gonna implement some substantial feature or component or, or concept in our database system. And the goal is that I want you guys to incorporate the topics we've either discussed so far or what we'll, we'll be discussing in the future uh, this semester in whatever your project is, as well as whatever your interest is. So if you're really interested in networking, because that's your, you're doing for your own research, or that's, that, that, that's what you like to do, then you should probably try to pick a project for that does networking stuff, right? Because I like it when students come along and they come with ideas that things that I haven't thought of um, outside the context of databases, and we can help us Im improve the database. So as I said, There'll be a sign-up sheet on the Google Doc spreadsheet that I'll send out uh, later tonight. Uh, you just list the, the, the members you have in your group, and then you'll have to make sure you pick a project topic that is unique or different from everyone else. And you can go back and look at what's done in the um, for the last two years I've taught this course, and you should not pick anything that they did. Unless, unless I say, you know, yes, go ahead and do that, uh, you should not pick something that's been done before, even if that code never merged into the system. Right, because not all the projects make it make it to the full system. So, what's expected for Project Three? So, you have to do a proposal, and that'll be due again on the Monday. We come back from spring break, and that's just you, you and your group come up here and give a five-minute presentation about what you want to do, and we'll talk about what should be in that proposal. Um, I guarantee uh, for these talks, everyone will have Mac laptops, and the Mac laptops never work on this thing, and you'll see, you'll see that. Uh, every single time. And then you do a project update about yeah, as we get closer to the end of the semester. And then uh, also during the semester, you, you do code reviews with each other, and I'll explain what that is in a second. And then on the whatever our date is for our final that's scheduled by the university, that one will have the final presentations. We'll have pizza, we'll have soda, and you'll come and give a demo what, what you actually did. And then you don't get a, a grade until you actually do the code drop. And the code drop is you submit a PR on GitHub, and it can merge cleanly into the master branch without any conflicts. Okay? All right, so the proposal. And we have about 13, 12 or 13 groups in the class, so everyone gets five minutes. You basically come up here and you say, this is what I want to do. Uh, then you discuss things like how you're actually going to do it, meaning like what files you think you need to modify or add, how you're actually going to test to see whether your implementation is actually correct. And then how are you actually going to evaluate your work to see whether it actually worked, made sense or not? And this is why I had you guys write in your synopsis for these readings about what are all the different workloads uh, that they're using to test their things. And so now you know what benchmarks you have. And we have actually, every, we have most benchmarks implemented and ready to run for you um, that, that you can use. Not all of them work, but we can fix that over time. Then the status update. Basically, you know, uh, a few weeks before the end of the semester, you come, give another presentation in the class, and you basically say, here's what we're, here's here's how far we've gotten in our system. Uh, here's what we had to change in our in our proposal because it, you know this we didn't have this feature or this thing was broken, right? Um, and then anything that surprised you during the process of like, oh my gosh, this one piece of the code was amazing, we could totally use this. Another piece was terrible, and we had to we have to uh, avoid it or rewrite it. So a big part of the course, also the course grade would be for the project three, will be your code review. So what will happen is you, every group is going to be paired up with another group, and you'll submit PRs to each other, and you use the GitHub API to do a code <coughs> review. Um, and the idea here is get feedback on what you're doing as well as to understand what other people have done in, in the system. So this would be a big part of it, you know, going out in your career of working at software companies. It's not just like you write code and throw it over to the network, you know, throw it over the wall, and it, someone's going to pick it up and, and you know, polish your turd. 
right? You want to learn how to write high quality code, and this is important in the database system um, because we want things to be correct and, uh, and, and functional. So there'll be two rounds of reviews, um, and <coughs> last year people did this, and I, and I, I don't want people to do this. I don't want people to break up the reviews where you know one group member does the first round, the second group member does the, the, the second round, right? Everyone should be involved in both of these code reviews. And Prashant and I will look through and provide feedback about like, oh, this is a good idea, this was good, this is bad, or you know, what about this, what about that, right? And it's again not me, to, you know, sort of forcing you to do this because I want you to do this. It's more like I want you to learn how to do this because this is going to come up throughout the rest of your career of learning how to read other people's code make sense of it, and write meaningful or, or helpful code reviews. <clears throat> All right, and then for the final presentation, again, this will be 10 minutes on the, on the schedule final exam, and there'll be food and, 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 and prizes. All the database companies send me their t-shirts, and everyone, everyone will get a database t-shirt at, at the end of the semester. Uh, pick your favorite company. Um, and ideally, if you have a demo of your, of your work, that would be a big deal. So last year, some kids did UDFs, so they showed how they can run UDFs. Um, then there's always you know, performance numbers of you know, uh, the various things they actually implement. So having a demo on the last day, or even for the, the project update, would be a, really cool. And that gets people excited. And then these won't be recorded. They, they, won't, they won't be on YouTube. So don't worry about embarrassing yourself. Okay? <laughs> and at the end, you have a code drop. And the code drop is that uh, all, you, you, you've addressed all the issues and concerns in your code reviews. You have test cases that prove that your thing is actually being correct. The, uh, you'll see this when you, if you have a PR and you set up uh, coveralls, right? we compute the code coverage of your tests. So if you, if you write a lot of code and your code coverage goes down, that's bad. Your coverage should always be stable or going up. And then you need to provide documentation on what you actually did in a separate markdown file. Um, and then the order that will determine how we uh, merge, merge these PRs is, will be random because you know, some people may, may conflict with another and to make it fair with everyone, we, just, we make it random. And then whoever comes before you, you have to merge their complex in your PR before you get a final grade. OK? So any questions about what's expected of you, as, as, you know, for the project itself? Yes? So in addition to the source code and the presentation, is there any kind of report you have to write? That's the markdown file, the documentation. Okay. Like, what did you do? And, and so how, like, how extensive, how long should that be? Um, I mean, I'm not looking for pages and pages and pages. We actually have a template for you to use to already to say how do you document what your teacher was. And in some ways, too, the final presentation is, is like the report. Yeah. Question or no? Wait, so is there like an actual defined date by which the code drop has to happen? Yeah, there's like, whatever it says on the website. Like, it's like the, uh, the couple of days before the I have to turn in grades. Because okay. some of you are graduating. Without, without grades, you can't graduate. So I need, and we need time to make sure you know, we get everything done. It's whatever it says on the website. OK, so I want to talk about some project topics you can look into. So there's a bit of a large list here. Again, I'll post this on the website, and I'm happy to discuss anything in more detail. Um, so we'll just go through, through all of these, OK? All right, so the first one is uh, to work on our query optimizer. So I had a master student, a plucky master student in the last year, write a brand new query optimizer from scratch. Uh, it's very impressive. And he wrote one based on the Cascades model, which you'll read about after the spring break, which is a sort of a way to organize and do transformations in your query optimizer to generate an optimal query plan. Essentially going from the SQL plan to the actual plan that the data systems can execute. Um, and so Cascades model is sort of the state of the art, although it's from the 90s, it's sort of the state of the art, the way to do this. This is actually what SQL Server does in their system. And we'll, you'll end up reading a paper that shows that SQL Server actually has you know, one of the best optimizers out there. So we have one of these as well. So the idea here is you want to basically expand our optimizer that we have. Uh, and we want to support things like outer joins, expression rewriting, so like take a between clause and convert that to an or clause, and then support nested queries. And so I want to say, I say if you work on this project, and I highly encourage you to do this, um, one, we have students around here that are, that are still here. Like Gus has been working on this. Boe worked on it last semester, and he's still here. We have students around that can help you uh, get, get started on this. And then you're going to have to send me your CV uh, because the companies are, are, are banging on my door to hire people that know how to work on Optimizer. I'm dead serious. So here's, 
Here's one email I got from in, in October from somebody that's a very famous database person, and he has a, he has a database company. He's like, anybody out there know any potential loose query optimizer folks that are in San Francisco Bay? It might be get bored restless. Like he's trying to hire a database you know optimizer person. Uh, and then another guy sent me a more more vitriolic or profane email, and he says, uh, I hate you with all my passion, but before you die, I need to hire somebody who knows query optimization, right? <laughs> um, so again. You will have no problem finding a job if you work on query optimizers. So I encourage you to consider this. But I will admit, it's not easy, right? It's a complicated thing. Um, and but there's, again, there's enough things around here. There's enough people around here that we can help you. All right, the next thing we want to support are schema changes. So think of like you know, add, to, add, add column, drop column, alter table, those kind of commands. Uh, so we don't have these. We want them. Um, so for this. The idea would be you have to support and in the, in the, add support in the SQL parser and the planner to be able to take an alter table command and actually use something with it. Uh, and then sort of start easy, like changing the column name. That's just changing the catalog. That's easy. But then adding column, adding and dropping column and changing column type, these are things that are more complicated and we want to add support for them. And I would say this is something we're also involved in a paper, uh, if you're interested in research, that we want to see how we can do this in an efficient manner using uh, multi-versioned catalogs. So the idea here is I could add a column and not have to update all my existing tuples the way my SQL and Postgres do. Uh, I can do this in the background or lazily and just know that I have an old version of a, of a, of a, of a, a tuple that's running on an old version of, of the catalog and convert it on the fly based on how I, how I need it. But again, so the very first thing we do is just add support in the SQL parser and the planner, and then you support change column name. That should be the, you know, the first two things that are pretty easy to do. Related to this, we also want to be able to support adding and dropping indexes. So we can drop indexes now. That's easy. You just remove it from the catalog and it disappears and you clean it up later uh, in the garbage collector. But we can add an index, but we cannot do it transactionally. Meaning if we have a million tuples and we start adding an index, but then we, we modify that table as we're building the index, we're going to miss those changes. So the idea is that we want, actually, we want to do this correctly. So I think I talked about this before when we talked about the catalogs. The way to actually impl implement this in a safe manner is you have this little delta storage thing you prop up, and that absorbs all the changes you make to the table while you're building your, 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 your index, and then you go back and rectify or, or reconcile those, those changes by locking the table and, and then updating the index. Um, what would be really cool if you can actually su add support for building the index in parallel, and actually say, like, I want to use one thread, two thread, four thread, or any arbitrary number of threads, have them split up the work and do, do the scans and build the index. Right? So that's one project. I'm also uh, very interested in pursuing the Cicada model for storing our indexes as, as data tables themselves. So right now, again, we have the BW tree. That's just everything stored in the heap. Uh, your skip list you guys are building, that's all stored in the heap. So as you see, you're doing all this extra stuff to handle garbage collection and concurrency in your, in your skip list because it's disconnected from the regular tables themselves, which already has these features. So the idea here is, can we do what Cicada do, does and store our index directly as nodes inside the data table? So we have, uh, we can get a basic B plus tree from the hyper guys in, in Germany. And the idea is then we can take that and, and then implement that in our system um, and see how this works. So there's a bunch of stuff you have to change, like you need to support, the, have the index factory, be able to support, you know, uh, constructing an index and have it being backed by a table. Um, you need to add support for fixed length binary attributes that are inline in the, uh, in the table itself, because otherwise you're going to the varlan pool, which is, again, another indirection layer. So there's a, bunch, there's a bunch of things you have to fix in the higher level system to make this work, but then the core thing would actually be taking the B plus tree and putting it directly inside the table. And there's another thing where I'm very interested in this as a possible research paper um, so if you can be around for a bit longer than a semester, this is something that we, 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 can, we can talk about. Next one is sequences or auto increment keys. Again, just think of it as a, as a global counter that's stored in the catalog, and then you say, get me the next ID, and you add one to it and increase that. And as I talked about before, uh, you have to be careful about this because it doesn't follow under the same transaction protections as regular tuples do when you modify them, right? Because you want to have... You want to have transactions be able to both, you know, two transactions that are running at the same time, both update this counter and not collide with each other or not abort because one guy read it before the other guy did. So to do this, we're going to add a special case in the transaction manager to be able to recognize, oh, it's a sequence, not a regular data table. 
uh, tuple and then allow multiple transactions to modify it. And then when we have the new write ahead log manager that, that we're implementing in place, we make sure that this thing, that this update gets logged out at least before the, you know, the, when any transaction has read a value that has been in our sequence, we make sure that that's getting written out before it's allowed to commit. So you want to add support for the next val function, which we can do now because we stored the, the, the pointers to uh, the catalog, uh, pointers to function in the catalog. And then ideally, if you add support attribute type, which is just a, a sort of a syntax sugar for defining a, a sequence in, in a table. So again, this is another one where I think there's a paper here. I can't guarantee that, but it'd be interesting to see, you know, if you, after you implement the basic, uh, the, the basic sequence uh, implementation, what can we do to actually speed this up, make it run faster, and compare what other systems do? Um, for views, uh, so this says, so view again is basically like a think of it like a, a virtual table. You can have a view that's always computed on the fly. You can have a materialized views that's incrementally updated. Uh, so one interesting project might be to actually pursue either, either one of these, having materialized views or regular views. And for for materialized views, we can um, we can uh, rely on the fact that we, we we have basic support for triggers, so that when you update a table, you can then force an update to the materialized view. The dumbest thing for a materialized view is every single time you you update the table, just rerun the query and cache the result. Um, but there's probably uh, better things or smarter things you can do. The next thing we want to handle also is maybe do pre-compiled queries uh, for our LLVM engine. So right now, any single time you create a table and you, and you execute a query on it, the first time it sees that query, it has to compile it and run it. But there's obviously some queries that we know we're going to probably run ahead of time, like insert queries or delete queries or basic select star queries that we can pre-compile ahead of time, cache that in our, in our catalog or statement cache, and then when the query comes along, we, can, we don't have to do that expensive compilation every single time. So where this actually matters a lot, it would be in the catalog, because the catalog basically is doing the same queries over and over again. You know, give me the row that has this table name. Um, so we want to be able to pre-compute these things as well when we boot our system up and store all these things. So this would give you, uh, you would have to touch you know, the LLVM code, the catalog code, and, um, and possibly the query planner as well. Right, and one cool thing to, to consider is, instead of compiling an ent entire query, can we actually compile bits and pieces of this and then stitch them together at, uh, uh, on the fly? So maybe I, I only compile the iterator or the where clause of a select statement, and then I can then uh, cache that and use that as a, as a, as a drop-in for any p possible select statement I have that comes after that. Uh, for tile group compaction, right now, uh, we never free memory. It's a big problem. Uh, so if I insert a million tuples, I have to allocate all that memory for the, to store that. There's no way to get around that. But then I delete a million tuples, the, the Peloton never gives the memory back. And so what we want to be able to do is, is compact our tile groups and free up space. So the easiest way to do, the easiest thing to do is if you notice you have, you have an empty tile group and you have... 10 or more already you know, empty tile groups, then it's okay for you to go ahead and just free that memory entirely. What will be really tricky and really cool is that if you notice you have two tile groups that are half full, then what you can do is put them to a single tile group, you know, combine them together, and then free up one of them. Right? And you can do this because we can, we can mark tile groups as being immutable, meaning we won't ever actually insert new values, we'll only delete values or delete old versions. And so when we have half of the versions deleted, in one tile group and half the version, version deleted in another tile group, we can go ahead and, and compact them. And so, for, excuse me, for this, you, ha you have to have a, implement a new thread in our system to do background compaction, which we, we currently don't have. All right, uh, multi-threaded queries. So, Prashant is currently working on a new feature now, <coughs> excuse me, to um, add support for basic multi-threaded queries. So this is something we'll cover after this, the, the spring break. But right now when a single query shows up, one thread will execute it from beginning to end. But what we can do is we know we have to touch a lot of data. We can take that one query, split it up into subtasks, have them run on se separate threads, and then combine the results at the end. So for this, we'll be working with Prashant to expand his support for intro query parallelism with multiple threads. Uh, we want to add support for index scans. Uh, mark joins and other things in, in, in our engine. 
right? And if you really want to go buck wild, we'll see this in the morsels paper for hyper. But one thing would be really kind of cool to do is have our threads be able to run tasks on data that's local to them. So if you're aware that I have my data, my, my table split up between two sockets, all the threads that run on one socket access data that's on that socket, and all the threads on the other socket access data that's local to them. And you don't have to go over the bus between the two sockets. Again, this is something we'll cover more after the, the semester. Database compression we've already talked about in, in, this, uh, in this, this semester so far. So last year we had students implement uh, delta encoding. Um, so it'll be interesting to see whether we can have maybe do dictionary encoding. We didn't end up actually putting the delta encoding stuff in place because it was too uh, hacky and had other issues. But it'll be interesting to see uh, whether we can actually support true delta encoding this time. Another project I'm interested in is supporting temporary tables. So right now in SQL, you can do like create temporary table. It's basically an ephemeral table that gets blown away or deleted as soon as the client disconnects. So it ends up having to go in the catalog because if you have to treat it like a regular table uh, and you have, you know, the query planner needs to know about it, right? You have to include it. But then when the, when the client disconnects, then you want to throw it away. So for this, uh, you'd have to add support for uh, the catalog, the binder, and the planner to be able to recognize this, be able to generate the, the temporary table uh, on the fly as needed. Um, so I, I don't know how, how difficult this will be, uh, but I suspect there's going to be a bunch of changes we have to make up in the upper levels of the system to make this work. Uh, finishing up, uh, we're also interested in adding support for the enum type. So an enum basically is like, like, like in C++ or, or, or Java, right? You, you can define some labels for, uh, for some fixed values, and they, they just get mapped to integers. So for this, we have to add support in the catalog to handle the enum type, have to add support in the SQL parser and the planner to be able to handle this. Uh, a student here in the front has been working on arrays, so you're going to store the enum as an array in the catalog, so you have to rely on his code. And then you have to add support for the LLVM and the LLVM engine expression evaluation support enums as well. And the last one is to do alternative networking protocols. So right now, again, we speak the Postgres wire protocol, but we have tried to architect our networking layer so that we can have uh, different implementations of different wire protocols be supported uh, natively. And then they sort of hit the traffic cop layer where that's sort of the, the standard uniform API that those protocol handlers deal with. So I'd be interested in adding support for Kafka or Memcache so that you can write, again, you can write Memcache code or mem, mem, Memcache commands that can interact with the database system. And those just get converted into SQL statements that then operate directly on the database system. So for this, I uh, need to overhaul the client communication handling code. We've already sort of done that. I don't know how well it actually works. And then for Memcache, we, we basically we write get and puts into prepared statements. All right, so again, I'm going through these very quickly. Just, again, I'll post this online or you ask, you send emails if you have questions. The idea is just showing you what I expect as, as the scope of a project. Some are obviously harder than others. Um, so uh, if you have any questions about, like, you know, is this really hard? Is this going to be really difficult? Or is this too easy? Then send me an email and we can talk about it. All right, so our goal is to expand our SQL based regression suite that Chen Yu wrote. Um, so that we can make sure that whatever you implement actually doesn't break any, any of our high-level functionalities. Easier said than done. This is still a work in progress, but this is my goal to have something running uh, before you guys actually start making uh, serious progress in your project. And then everyone's going to have to implement, implement their own C++ or Java or C code or SQL test cases to make sure that their, their, their implementation works correctly. Okay? So for computing resources, you should use the same MemSQL machines you use in the uh, class projects. Uh, this should have an adequate amount of DRAM and, and CPU cores for you to test your implementation. If you need special hardware, uh, then please let me know. We can see what, what we can do about getting it for you. Uh, so for example, one year, the students were implementing parallel logging, and they needed a bunch of SSDs. And so, we, so one of these machines have you know, has three or four SSDs you can use. So if you think you need something uh, let me know, and we'll get it for you, okay? So for testing your, 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 uh, your, your, your implementation, we have this benchmark framework called OTP, OTP Bench that has already a bunch of built-in um, uh, benchmarking frameworks or benchmark implementations that, that are all in the papers you guys read that you can use. Now, unfortunately, a bunch of these things are broken. Uh, 
I know that YCSB works and TPCH works. Well, fixing T TPCC and TTP now. But these are what you can then use for your for testing your projects. And so we already have scripts in place that you just you know you you, you set a few commands or set a few, few parameters to say where your server is, and it'll run the complete benchmark for you, right? So no one should be implementing TPCC from scratch. I know there's a micro benchmark in the code that you could use. Do not use that. You should be, oh, everyone should be going through the entire uh, SQL stack using OLTP Bench. OK? Uh, I did not update the date. This is wrong. Ignore this. But again, everyone should be uh, uh, doing a five-minute presentation after we come back from, from, from break. And I should be around next week. Uh, send me an email if you want to meet on campus or discuss things on Hangouts or Skype. OK? Any questions about Project 3? All right, so I'm dead serious. There's a midterm next next week. Uh, one year, the kid thought I was joking, and he's like, "Oh, I, you know, because I make jokes all the time in class." And he's like, "Oh, I thought you were joking about the midterm." I'm like, no, this is really. And so he didn't show up. There's really a midterm Wednesday, so please come, okay? And then after spring break, you'll do your project three proposals, and then project two again is due on Monday next week. All right, any questions about the midterm? All right, guys. Uh, Ignore this, the constraints. These are old stuff. All right. Uh, I will have office hours on Wednesday, right before the midterm. But if you want to meet before then, just send me an email and we can discuss. Okay? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, playing waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Feel a breeze as I skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. Then I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off, with same odds